Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14. Same scripture we read last year, last week, I mean. The setting, again, is Moses speaking to the Israelites. Moses had been leading the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years to the promised land. And finally, God says, now is the time. They will go into the promised land. But you, Moses, cannot because you disobeyed me. So Moses calls the Israelites together and gives them a very, very, very long speech. If you read it, it's page and page and pages. This is a portion of that speech. It's very important that Moses wants to tell the Israelites. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body, and the produce of your ground, and the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and will flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and all that you put your hand to. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. So all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will be afraid of you. The Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the offspring of your body and in the offspring of your beast and in the produce of your ground in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you only will be above, and you will not be underneath, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully. Do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Now we go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19. This is Jesus speaking to the crowd who had gathered around them, around him. He had been teaching them about the law, what it really means, because they had missed the point. Jesus says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For I truly say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it's all accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I would like to pray now the psalm that Charles read to us earlier instructs us or even commands us to enter the courts of God with thanksgiving, bring praise to his name. So would you pray with me please? Lord God, we are here to worship and praise you. We praise you, Heavenly Father. You are our provider and protector. And we thank you for all that you do for us. We praise you, Jesus, the Son of God. You are our Savior and Good Shepherd. 
Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We praise you, Holy Spirit of God. You are our comforter and counselor. And we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Your word is truth and eternal life. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us yourself. You are the living word of God. You are the way, the truth, and our life. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening our eyes. You are the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for opening our hearts and eyes and ears to the word of God. Heavenly Father, we pray for the advancement of the gospel. We pray for Rich and Cindy Brown in Spain. May you fill them with the spirit of God, the spirit of strength, of perseverance. Fill them with the spirit of faith, hope, and love. Fill them with the spirit of Jesus Christ that he might be made manifest to the people in Spain. And we pray that you would be raising up a Christian church in Spain, raising up leaders, men, women, to worship and serve you as you have asked. And we continue to pray, dear Father, for Triumphant Life Camp. We pray for the high schoolers this year or this week there. We pray that your spirit would fill the counselors and the staff and the pastors with the spirit of love for these students, that the spirit of Jesus Christ would fill them and be made manifest through them. We pray for the preaching and teaching of the word, that your spirit would empower your word, planting it in the hearts of those high school students and quickening it to life eternal. And Lord Jesus, we pray that your spirit would use your word even this morning here in this room in our hearts to your purposes. Your word is living and active, able to pierce to the division of soul and spirit, our, our heart and souls. May your spirit reveal the truth to us, for the truth is Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray, amen. Okay, Let's see if we can keep this thing working throughout. Danny, might want to turn me down just a little bit or a lot of bit. Uh, let me do this. Let me open us again with a word of prayer. Um, if you've noticed this, uh, we pray quite a bit. And there's a reason for that. Oh, this isn't supposed to be there. It's supposed to be there. It's because we affirm our dependence on God. God alone. If He doesn't come, if He doesn't work, then I'm just a guy talking. Greg's just a guy reading scripture, talking. Charles' just a guy talking in Sunday school. But if God comes, then we can be a people changed. We can be a people who, who can represent the true light of the world by being the light of this world. And so we pray, and, and we hope that it's not just prayer here at this moment, but we hope that what it's doing is that it is shaping in us through this repetition, these things that we do week in and week out as we come together as the people of God, that it shapes into us that we would be a people of prayer. It's the testimony in the early church, isn't it? We see in Acts chapter 2 that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' doctrine and to fellowship, which is the breaking of bread and prayer. That The church was defined by the apostolic teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and then was defined by fellowship, which is seen in the, the coming together around the communion table and prayer. This is what the church continually devoted themselves to. And sometimes I wonder if I was more devoted to that, what would the church look like? If we were more devoted to those things, what would the church look like? And then what would the community look like? And so with that, let us affirm our dependence on God in prayer. Father, we ask this morning simply that you would exalt Christ. Whatever is not of the word of God, whatever is not exalting to the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever is not empowered by the Spirit, that it would fall, Lord, by the wayside. We ask, O oh God, that you would not leave us unchanged but changed this morning. 
that you would help us to understand more about who Christ is through the word of God this morning. We thank you for preserving for us this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, this teaching as it's been so instructive to the church for thousands of years. Would it instruct our heart this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We just sang, let us love and sing in wonder, let us praise the Savior's name, and then this, he has hushed the law's loud thunder, and he has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. And, and one of the things that can be difficult for Christians, one of the things that we can struggle with, is that relationship between the law of Moses, Mount Sinai's flame, here in this the law of Moses, the law given in, in that old covenant era and the Christian. What does that look like for us? How do we think about it? And, and are, we, are we bound to obey that Mosaic law? Or are, we, are we bound in the same way that Israel was as the people of God to obey that covenant? And, and if not, why? And what does that look like? And it can be a difficult question. It can be a hard question. What do you do when you're, you're living your life and somebody comes up to you? Somebody comes up to me today and says, Nate, um, I noticed the tag on your shirt. You're wearing two different kinds of fabric in your shirt. And yeah, and we chuckle, but what do we do? What it, if you said that 3,000 years ago to an Israelite, they had a problem brewing. There was trouble. What about my diet? Now, I didn't have bacon this morning because I left early, but I love to have bacon. As a matter of fact, one time we were, I, I can't remember if it was Charles's graduation or maybe it was mine. I don't know. We always party at the same place and have all these parties at the Jackson's house. But one of our friends had brought a, a beautiful ham. And then before he cooked it, just because we're in the new covenant and he can, he wrapped it in bacon. <laughs> and when that thing came out, we were praising the root of Jesse. So how do we understand the law? How do we understand what Jesus says here? Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish but fulfill. Now, it's interesting. I think that there are certain things that are going to help us as we look through the, the testimony. We're going to look uh, first in the Old Testament to see the way in which the word of God, the law of God was spoken about. But before we do that, let me, let me just kind of reorient us a little bit where we are in the book of Matthew. Last week, we took a little break and um, talked about TLC, talked about the life and the mission of the church. And, um, but remember, we find ourselves now in the book of Matthew, and Jesus has really just entered in his public ministry. Chapter 4 in Matthew, we saw where Jesus faced the temptation of the devil, and then Jesus calls his disciples and you remember, Jesus calls them from their fishing boats, and, and as he will continue to do with the rest of his disciples and apostles, Jesus calls people to a life of radical devotion to himself. Jesus calls people, in essence, to leave everything behind, to turn and to follow Jesus. Jesus calls them to a glorious existence, doesn't he? I mean, where else would you want to be than following Christ himself? And yet, when he calls them and when he calls us to that kind of a life, he does not call us to a life full of roses, does he? Not at all. He's calling them to what will be three years of immense persecution. And all of their people, remember these are Jewish disciples now, he calls them, all of their people or most of their people, not all of them, but most of their people are not going to get them. As a matter of fact, they're not going to like them anymore. They're not going to like what they're about. Most of them will reject this Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, after all, can anything good come from there? I mean, really, who is this guy? And so they're called to a life of privation, of want, of necessarily being dependent on God, which isn't a bad thing, but they are without everything. And there are those who are going to come to Jesus and say, Lord, we want to follow you. And Jesus will look at them and he will say, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now you come and follow me. Is he worth it? Well, enter the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says to them, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
Those are not terms that we would normally associate with blessing, are they? When you mourn, that is, doesn't feel like a blessing. Some of you, many of you, were around this week, and we mourned. We mourned for the loss of somebody, and it hurt. And as Christians who understand the brokenness of this world, we're going to mourn, and it's going to hurt. And Jesus said, blessed are you. Why would he say that? Well, he would need to comfort them, wouldn't he? Because this is what he's called them to. This is the kind of life that he called them to. And Jesus, in the Beatitudes, and we're going to just get a little structure of the Sermon on the Mount here. So in the Beatitudes, Jesus pronounces a blessedness on the kind of life that is definitive of those who will follow Christ. The way that Pastor Charles said it is, you can look at this in one sense as a test. Does this define you? Is this characteristic of who you are as a follower of Jesus? And if so, then yeah, you're probably a follower of Jesus. And Jesus wants you to know that though it's hard, you are blessed. And you're blessed beyond anything that you could imagine. Though it will be difficult, though it will cause you tears, you're blessed. Though you will, and think about this, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, I know when I read that sort of in my Christianese way of thinking, that's a great thing, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Have you been really hungry? Have you gone three or four days without food where you feel like you're going to die? H have we ever experienced thirst in the way that they would have understood? Where it feels like the walls are crashing in around you as a follower of Jesus with the spirit of God in you, the brokenness of this world will do that to you. It will cause you to feel like you are choking without the ability to drink or to choke your food down because you don't have water because that's what sin has done to our world. It's broken it. And Jesus says, if you feel that way, you're blessed. Because you don't feel that way without the Spirit of God. Now, our text today, and then, and then Jesus goes on. I don't want to skip over this. And he says, it's those kind of people who feel that way. It's those kind of people who, who react that way to this world. It's those kind of people who will be the salt of the earth. We need those kind of people. And so if you're in here this morning... As a Christian and you're overwhelmed by the brokenness of the world, you're blessed. And you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I mean, a light shines brightly and is seen in, in the midst of darkness, isn't it? You're the light of the world and the implication is we need light in this world. And Jesus says, it's those kind of people who are going to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And then our text stands as kind of a hinge, locking together those beatitudes with the light of the world and whatnot with the ethical teachings that will come after it. As Jesus starts to tell us what it looks like to live this kingdom life, this Christian life, what it looks like to follow Jesus. And let me just preface this. We're not going to get into probably that ethical teaching today, but this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is putting before the people of God. An ethic, a way of life, a moral construct, however you want to think of this, a morality, whatever you want to think of, a new law, the law of Christ, however we want to conceive of this. He is calling us to live in such a way that in our actions, as much as with our mouth and with our words, that we testify to who Jesus Christ is. He is calling us to live in such a way that we reveal the person and work of Jesus. In other words, our life in the very way that we live and the ethic that we maintain is a proclamation of the gospel. And I think we'll see that as we work through this. One of my favorite ones to look at, and we'll spend a lot more time as we get there, is just that idea where Jesus comes on the scene and he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right out of the law of Moses. And then he says, but I say to you, but I say to you, and, and remember, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, what we might call equal retributive justice. This was the foundation of justice, the justice of God. In other words, if Charles came up to me and in a fit of rage, which he would never do, he's a kind and gentle soul, that one. And for the record on the recording, I don't know why everybody's laughing. It's lost on me. If Charles came up to me, though, and poked out my eye, Equal retributive justice would say, he's got to lose one. It's only right. He's offended me. 
He has sinned against me, and that is due to him. And Jesus says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. And there are volumes written on this. Well, the culture, and in that culture, it was this, and what it really means is that, and it's really quite simple. We're called in that ethic to testify to the gospel. What happens in the gospel? Jesus, the God of the universe, is sinned against And there is a punishment due, sin, and because God is just, and because he is the judge of all the earth, and because the judge of all the earth will indeed do what is right, sin must be dealt with. Not in the way that we would think, though. Not in the way that necessarily denies reconciliation between the sinner and the holy God. So what happens? There is a stroke due for the stroke that came, and the offended party, God himself in the person of Jesus, takes that stroke himself. What does Jesus do? The gospel is that Jesus turns the other cheek. Jesus takes your punishment. And the same thing all throughout this, and we're gonna work through that, hopefully slowly and in such a way that that it sinks into our heart. You've heard it said, don't murder. I say, don't get angry. Why? Because that's what Jesus didn't do to us. And so on and so forth. And and, And our passage, though, stands as a hinge between these. And it's going to help us as we, as we sort of set the foundation for what's coming in these ethical teachings and as we're able to look back on the Beatitudes, what we read today, and let me read this for us. Jesus says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. And, and I have to pause right there. It dawned on me as I was reading and rereading and rereading this. Jesus absolutely assumed that his Jewish disciples who were following him, who had gathered on the mountain, and then the crowds who were there too, these Jewish crowds, Jesus absolutely assumed that what he said in the Beatitudes and in the salt of the earth was enough for them to go, wait a minute, you're trying to abolish the law and the prophets. Jesus says, don't think that that's what I came to do. Why would he say that? Because that's exactly what they would have been thinking. Why would he have said that? And and enter in the text that Greg read for us in Deuteronomy 28. Now, this is, um, the the law of Moses is in many ways very complex. In many ways, very simple. Uh, The plain teaching of the word of God, the characteristics of God that shine through in many ways are very simple. But but what we read in Deuteronomy 28, and, and Deuteronomy 28 through 30, at the end of Deuteronomy here, as we know, as, as the people of God get ready to enter the promised land, we have in Deuteronomy 28 through 30 the covenantal blessings and the covenantal curses. For faithfulness to the covenant, you will be blessed. For unfaithfulness to the covenant, all of these curses will come upon you. And so Moses begins speaking, blessed will you be, uh, and, and, and if you remember what Greg read, they were going to be blessed in their basket and their land was going to produce and, and their womb would produce and all of these blessings would come upon them and they would conquer their enemies around them. Your enemy will come at you one way and they will flee seven ways. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that there will be a complete and total conquering of the enemy. That's what it means to flee seven ways, the biblical number of completion. And so there would be total conquest over the people. There would be an absolute blessing in the land for the people of God. And Jesus shows up, and this is what they're anticipating when they hear blessed. Oh, blessed are you going to be here in this land. Finally, finally they're thinking the Romans are going to be gone. And we're going to have this land and God will open the storehouse of heaven and the rains will pour down and there will be abundance once more and we are going to see one like King David sitting on the throne. Finally, the time has come and Jesus opens his mouth. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You're not poor in spirit when you conquer your enemies. Blessed are those who mourn. You don't mourn when you divide the spoil, you rejoice. You throw a party, you have a festival in God's goodness for what he's done. Blessed are the meek. You don't conquer when you're meek. So what is going on? So Jesus says, don't think I came to abolish that. And here we get into a little bit of the complexity of the law of Moses. As as we're called as Christians to think deeply about the word of God and the things of God. We see that those blessings, remember, were based on covenant faithfulness. And if you've read the Old Testament, you know that there's a problem. Or 
Let me put it differently so it sinks in a little bit for us. If you've looked in the mirror, you know there's a problem. We are not faithful to the covenant. We're not faithful to the covenant. And so Jesus is going to help us explain this. He says, don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. Hmm, it's interesting. Now, one thing that we're going to see is this idea of fulfillment stands somewhere in between abolishing, which is to say this, that that was just we're doing away with that. That didn't work. There has, there's no validity there. This was, a, this was a misadventure and a bad endeavor, this whole law thing. Let's do something new. Oops, kind of a thing. Or maybe not oops, because we know there's no oops in God, but even this. Well, you guys certainly blew that. So let me try something else. It's not that kind of abolishing. It's not the complete doing away with the testimony of Moses, with the entire old covenant system, the law and the prophets and all that we heard. It's not that at all. But on the other hand, it cannot be a maintaining of it the exact way that it was. How do we know that? Well, we just saw one of them. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Now notice, as we think about that's a helpful paradigm for us. It wasn't a doing away with the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, in the sense that it wasn't a making light of sin, was it? It wasn't a brushing under the rug the fact that there had been sin, that there had been a stroke that was given, But the fulfillment of God's justice came in a way that nobody anticipated. And we have the same sort of thing working here. But what I want to do before we unfold that completely is I want us to look at a couple things. I want us to scroll through the Old Testament. We're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 4 to begin. We want to say this, and we're going to look quickly at a few verses to support this. That it is clear when we read the Scriptures that no man... No person can add to or take away from the word of God. This is not just in Revelation. This is throughout the scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I'm going to begin in verse 2. We read this. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding to you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I commanded you. You're not going to add to this, and you're not going to take away from it. I think sometimes it's so easy, and maybe this will help foster a little humility in us. I think it's so easy for me to read my New Testament and the gospel examples, and, and I see the Israelites and the Pharisees, and, and I see these people, and they're just not getting Jesus. They want to kill Jesus. They don't understand what he's doing, but, but they were steeped in this. No man is adding to or taking away from the word of God. Nobody is doing that. And so here comes, and and this is the glory and also part of the mystery of the way God reveals himself in Jesus. When Jesus, and and of course 2,000 years this side of the cross, we think of Jesus, eternal son of God, God himself, and we're right to think that way. But when Jesus steps on the scene, a man from Nazareth steps on the scene. A boy who grew up in their midst steps on the scene. And they know Nobody changes this. What is he doing? I think it's so easy for us to go, Pharisees, they were just a bunch of knuckleheads. Man, if I would have been the religious leader of that day, I'd have had it all right. If we don't at least struggle with their tension, we haven't understood God's rich teaching in the Old Testament. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 12. This time in verse 32, we come to this passage and we read this. Whatever I commanded you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. Do you think Moses wants the children of Israel to understand something? Hey, this law, this can bring about, and we're gonna, we read this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, this can bring about immense blessing. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with it. Proverbs chapter 30 Verses 5 and 6 teach us this. Now, this is right later on in the history of Israel. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Amen. Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. Did you know you don't have to deny the word of God to be a liar? You can simply add to it things of your own making. To add to God's truth is to lie. 
That's important for us to keep in mind as we witness to this culture, isn't it? One of the biggest problems that we will face as a culture and in the church, one of the biggest problems that the church faces, let me say that, is is not necessarily the, the denial of the inerrancy of the scripture. It's not that people are denying that God, uh, Scripture is inerrant or even that it's inspired. What so often happens in the churches is they deny the sufficiency of Scripture. It's not enough. It may be completely true. It may be inspired by God, but we need more. God says, don't you dare add to my word. Okay. Well, now we've got a problem, don't we? With Jesus. Well, maybe not. Here's what we need to keep in mind, and we we talked about this just a little bit last week, at the intro of last week's sermon. The provisions of God's law, that is to say that his ordinances, his precepts, his statutes, the sacrificial system, the religious and political structures that God brought in through his his law, these are binding upon us based solely on the fact that God has ordained them. Which is to say that these laws that come from God, they don't possess as autonomous things, as rules, any sort of inherent value in and of themselves as if they were severed from God. In the same way that a good moralist who doesn't believe in Jesus gains nothing, there's no inherent value in his moral action outside of dedication to Jesus. These laws were what they were and were binding because God himself ordained them. The law of God is to be understood as one of the means by which God has spoken to his people. And therefore, it is to be received on faith as the word of God. Not not as some autonomous uh, structure that is that has some sort of inherent value by itself, but because it's the word of God, we receive it as such. That's why in Deuteronomy 28, the literal rendering is this. If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and then obey his commandments. Do you receive God's commandments today as just, um, just sort of some sort of way that's a good way for people to live? Do we talk to people about that? Well, if they would just live their life this way, they would do better. Uh, you hear this all the time. I'm praying for my cousin or my nephew or my grandson or my whatever. They've got into drugs and alcohol or they're running with the wrong crowd. If they would just live this way, if they would just get their act together, things would be better. Maybe in this life, maybe for a vapor of a second, but not for all of eternity. It would do them no ultimate good. The commandments are themselves not the central thing. The central thing is that God commanded them, that they were spoke by God. I think we're benefited, as we looked at a little bit last week, thinking about Adam in the garden. Was it that God, he created this beautiful garden and then he goes, ooh, You know, in order for the right amount of oxygen to be produced and all of this, I've got to have this one tree in the middle and it's going to be poisonous. (sighs) So what am I going to do? For their own good, I'm going to command them not to eat from it because, man, when they eat from that, they're going to die. Or was God trying to show them something even more fundamental to what it means to be human? Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is why it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, remember, because in the very moment that they came and they took from that tree, in the moment that they reached and made up their mind ever, before they even ever touched that fruit, what had they done? They had taken to themselves the knowledge of good and evil. They said, we don't really need you, God. We will decide what's right and wrong, and I know you commanded me with your voice not to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. And so they took from it, and they ate, and it wasn't the physical properties of the fruit or the chemical compounds that made it up. It was the fact that they turned their back on the voice of the Lord their God. We see this all throughout. I'm just going to read one section out of Jeremiah chapter 7. I've got multiple sections here in my notes. We're not going to have time to get into them. Jeremiah chapter 7 beginning in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house And proclaim there this word and say, this is what Jeremiah is to say as he stands in the gate of the Lord's house. That is to say, at the temple gate, to the people of God. 
Hear the word of the Lord, all of you of Judah who enter these gates and worship the Lord. You want to know what is at the fundamental heart of worshiping God? Responding to God himself. Not being a moralist, not responding to rules, not saying that I think that this way of life is a good way of life and therefore I will come to God. I don't know how many people I have met who have a moral structure that they think is good or they were given to, and because they think that the God of the Bible is most in line with their moral structure, they're going to come to him and they're going to tell other people to come to him. Not because he's the true and living God, but because he supports their already held worldview. That is not salvation. That is not worship. That is not how we honor the Lord. If you want to worship the Lord, you must hear the word of the Lord. And you must say, I don't care if it agrees with my word or not. If it doesn't agree with my word, may God be proved true and every man a liar, Paul says. That's worshiping God. Hear the word of the Lord, all of you of Judah who enter by these gates and worship the Lord. Verse 3, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I will let you dwell on this place. What do they need to amend? What's going on with them? Look at verse 4. Do not trust in deceptive words. Ah, notice here the contrast. Here, respond to the word of God and do not trust in deceptive words. Now, what's amazing in one sense and terrifying in another sense is the way these deceptive words come. Do not trust in the deceptive words saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Well, was it the temple of the Lord? Yes. What are they saying? Just because God has given you the law and the temple and you come to temple and you make these sacrifices, do not think that for any moment, for for any reason, that you are binding God or that you're twisting his arm because you make these sacrifices. It doesn't matter that this is the temple. Enter the prophet Ezekiel and his visions of the, the presence and the glory of God moving slowly and further away from the throne and the holy of holies till finally it's on the threshold and finally the spirit of God is just out of the temple. And by the time Jesus gets there, by the time Jesus gets there, he comes in there and he purges the temple. Why? Well, they were making sacrifices, but they turned it into racketeering. They turned it into a money-making business when it should have been a house of prayer. And remember, prayer isn't primarily God, I want, I need. A house of prayer is primarily coming To hear from God. This is why so many of the prayers that you read in the scripture are scripture. And so we have this. We have this idea that no man can add to or take away from the word of God. But also that the commandments themselves. The commandments themselves are only binding and have any merit because they come from God. And then one more piece to the puzzle that I think will help us. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and following. If you are a Christian and you heard Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and following, and you're as of yet unfamiliar to the point of memory with this passage, I would merely encourage you to become very familiar with this. This is one of the most powerful declarations of the gospel. Paul says in verse 21, now you remember what's happened for two and a half chapters up to this. First in chapter one, and and Paul has condemned all of mankind, specifically though those without the law of God, saying that the very nature of creation demonstrates the fact that there is a creator God and the fact that you have all turned away from him is indicative of your heart, not of him. That the truth is there to be clearly seen and because we are sinners, we suppress that truth in unrighteousness. And so I don't care what they tell you. I don't care what kind of academic degrees people have on the wall. When they tell you intellectually, I can't believe the Christian faith, they're not telling the truth. They may not know they're lying, but they're lying. It is an absolute moral issue. What they don't want to do is fall on the ground and confess Jesus is Lord. They want to be Lord. Why? Because we took the stinking fruit And we said, we don't need you to tell us what's right and wrong. And we all suffer the same plague that Adam had. So Paul condemns all of the Gentiles without the law of God saying that there is no excuse. There's no excuse. 
They have no excuse. So what do they need? They need people sent to them, don't they? To tell them the good news. But that's beside the point. Chapter 2 and, and then through chapter 3, what does Paul do? He says, okay, just now I've dealt with the Gentiles, but hey, Jewish people, my brethren, I don't want you to think that you're any better off. You think, and this is the way the Jews thought, you think that because God gave you the law, you're righteous. Because you have been, you, you, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. We have the temple service. So of course we're righteous. Paul says, you've misunderstood the law. It has closed Every one of you up as sinners. If the law doesn't reveal to you that you're a sinner, you've missed the law. If the law doesn't cause you, when you come to temple to offer that sacrifice, when you take your pet that you have loved and, and offer it for your sin, if that doesn't cause you to cry out, God, redeem me. I don't want to keep doing this. My sin is bringing death. There's got to be something better. There's got to be something more. Can't there just be one that ends it all? Do I have to keep doing this? Could you please change my heart? I'm broken and week in and week out and year in and year out at the great day of atonement. I'm reminded of how broken I am. The law shut him up under sin. Now verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, let's pause and think about that for just a minute. There are two critical things in there that are going to help us understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus, Paul says this, that there has now been a manifestation of the righteousness of God that is apart from the law and the prophets, different than the law and the prophets. And then notice what he says about the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets, they witnessed to God's righteousness. The law and the prophets were like the signpost. God's righteousness is over there. They're a witness. They're bearing witness or they're on the stand, if you will. Uh, I've seen something of God's righteousness and let me define it and describe it to you the best that I can. Now we know that in the old covenant, that the revelation of God and uh, specifically of Christ, we're gonna see in a minute, came in types and shadows. But they were just witnesses. Now Paul says this, apart from that witness... The very righteousness of God has been manifested, made visible, or we could say this, taken on flesh, incarnate. The righteousness of God, no longer witnessed to by the law and the prophets, now stands in the person of Christ. He's been revealed. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all those who believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But this is what we want to say. And, and this is a very long introduction because this is a very small text in Matthew. And, and, and in order to understand what he's saying, we have to get these pieces. No one adds to or takes away from the law of God. No person does. God's law is binding because God has spoken it. And God's law was a witness to God's nature and character. Now why put those pieces there so that we can think through this? Now, you guys have probably heard this term before. I know I've heard Pastor Charles use it in Sunday school and when he's preaching, the term of progressive revelation, and that simply means that the way in which God has been revealing himself to mankind has progressed over time. Uh, I heard it mentioned in Sunday school today, Genesis 3.15, sometimes referred to as the first mention of the gospel. You guys remember this, the curse is being pronounced uh, after the fall and talking about the serpent, you know, that, that he will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, right? But that that seed of the woman will crush his head. And so we see there this illusion looking forward to the victory of Jesus Christ over sin, Satan, and death. But I'll tell you what, we know a lot more about that victory from Isaiah 53 than we do from Genesis 3.15. We know a lot more about the nature of the way that's going to work through the law of Moses than we do merely Genesis 3.15. We understand from the law of Moses that there is a necessity, a need for mankind to have some priest, somebody who would minister to us before God, somebody who could make atonement for our sins. We understand through the prophets that there is a need for us to hear the word of God, that somebody must bring God's word to us so that we can understand what to do and, and our knowledge grows and grows and grows. Now why is that important? If no one can take away from the word of God, no man can take away from the word of God. If the, if the commandments of God are binding 
and find their importance from the fact that they come from God himself. And if the law of God is meant to be a testimony to the character of God, then if God were to come with a fuller and a greater testimony concerning himself, then God and God alone could shift our understanding of that law. God and God alone could say, and I was trying to think of an analogy for this, and this is a really bad one, so just bear with me. And really bad in that it falls short on many levels, as many analogies do, but it would be sort of like this. Could you imagine if you found a key someday? You just wander around, you find this key, and on it it says, mercy, faithfulness, and justice. And so just with those three words on this key, you structure your life around those concepts the best you can, to the best of your ability. You, you, you don't fully understand all that's involved with them, but you labor because, and let's just say this, the key came wrapped in a present, right? It was a gift. I'm trying to bring in grace here, so this is a... Now, you structure your life around that. You've received that as a good gift and a good way to live your life, and it came from uh, someone you knew to be kind and had your well-being in mind, and you structure your life around that, and And yet, because it's a key, you know something about it. You know that it's supposed to open a door into something else. And so you structure your life around it, you structure your life around it, and one day, one day you've been looking your whole life, and one day there it is. Almost out of nowhere, there's the door, and you turn it, and you open it, and inside, what do you see? Not just the concepts, not just the words in a way that's a little vague to you, but you actually see mercy and justice and faithfulness and love and all of this being worked out in this realm. And you see it enacted in a person and they're living it out and they're doing it. And Now that key was great, but that key was meant to open the door and to get you there. And the law and the prophets functioned like that. The law and the prophets were a testimony to the coming king, to the coming Messiah, to the greater than Moses prophet, to, to, the, to the great high priest and every other aspect of it, to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so with the key that unlocks the entire Old Testament, we now live in a different realm. But we don't do away with that. Now let me jump back into Matthew. Jesus says, don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill I was trying to think of this. So what we have here is Jesus saying, I didn't come to do away with them. That would be crazy. They were this sign and they were pointing to the righteousness of God and I'm the righteousness of God that they were pointing to. I'm the very nature of God in human flesh. And so Jesus says, we're not abolishing that as a matter of fact. You guys ever thought about this? About two thirds of this is what? Old covenant. It would be a grave mistake for the church of Jesus Christ not to be in that two-thirds of Holy Scripture a lot, a lot, a lot. As a matter of fact, there are aspects of the person and work of Jesus that you cannot understand apart from that. Sometimes I think that sometimes it's so easy to think of Israel as the separate entity from us, but, but we need to think of ourselves that way. We need to let the Old Testament and the life and then the, the experiences and the sacrificial system and the law and all this of Israel shape our heart. What we, we probably think of a high priest and we, we think of Jesus and just what we read in Hebrews. You want to know what it means for somebody to be a faithful high priest? Well, read the law too. It's going to paint these pictures. In other words, what it's going to do? It's going to shape our soul in such a way that the reception of Jesus becomes glorious beyond what we could imagine. Because of what's shown. You, you want to you wanna rejoice in the kingship of Jesus? Well, read the book of Kings. Because it will leave you longing for a good king, a true king, who will lead his people in faithfulness, who will not maybe just for a moment will taste a little bit of glory and then poof, comes crashing down again. So Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. That they are absolutely valid absolutely necessary for life and godliness, absolutely necessary for faith. But, and let me say this, the best interpretation of Scripture is always the interpretation that makes the best sense of the literal, grammatical, historical, cultural, linguistic, linguistic aspects of the text in such a way that reveals and points to Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't point to Jesus Christ, we have not understood the Bible yet. That's what Jesus says. I didn't come to abolish it, but fulfill it. 
We, we've been in Matthew. All Matthew does is quote the Old Testament. That's talking about Jesus. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus fulfilled this, this, and this, and we're just bombarded. And so Jesus says this, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. When we read in Deuteronomy 28, not all of that is accomplished. We don't experience the conquest of the enemies of God like that talked about. So how is it that Jesus is pronouncing blessedness on those of us who were poor in spirit? But that shows like a a great big eternal party. What's going on? Well, though we don't yet experience it, the foundation for it has been accomplished. We follow him, and this is those of us now who are defined by those attributes on the Sermon on the Mount, definitive of what it looks like to follow Jesus, but we follow him who was absolutely faithful to the covenant and has secured those promises on our behalf. And there is coming a day, is there not? There is coming a day when all that is looked forward to there Not just in Deuteronomy, but I'm mindful of the prophet Isaiah when he looks forward to a time when all unrighteousness will be done away with, when the Prince of Peace will reign eternally and tears will be wiped away from every eye. Did Jesus abolish that? Absolutely not. John, in the book of Revelation, says this is coming. And why is it coming? Because there was one who stood worthy to unlock the scrolls and to accomplish all that God had promised for his people. And so how do we get there? How does that become ours? We must, we must, we must be clothed in the white robes of the righteousness of the blood of Jesus. We must have Jesus' death atone for our sins, otherwise all we get is the covenant curses. And we must also have Jesus' righteousness placed on us like a rose and like a garland upon our head. And then, loved ones, we get to experience that and we get to sit back with the throngs throughout the ages, and we get to sing, as we did this morning, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Jesus, I'm not doing away with that. I'm accomplishing it for you. I'm fulfilling it for you, so that every time you fall short, every time you fall flat on your face, every time you look at yourself and scream, I'm not worthy, you can say, but he is. And he died on my behalf. And God raised him from the dead for my justification and all those who set their hope on this Christ will never be disappointed. That's the gospel. Jesus came and he has hushed the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. I was thinking about this as we read this. No, it's lost. It says that he will bring us home to God. And that's true in a manner of speaking. But do you want to know the even more glorious reality? Just read the end of the book. Read Revelation. God's coming here to dwell with us. God is making the entire earth his temple. And there will be no unrighteousness. There will be no wondering about what God is doing The glory of the Lord will cover the face of the earth as the waters cover the sea. Jesus wasn't abolishing all of those promises. He said, I'm taking care of it for you. I'm gonna do that for you. And if you will simply heed the voice of God, or let me put it differently, if you will simply give your life to follow after the eternal word of God who came and took on flesh and tabernacled among us, our Lord Jesus Christ, if you will say, I want that life, I want that existence, I want to never mourn again, I want to never do away with, or I want to never feel pain again, I want all in, injustice and unrighteousness to be done away with, if you will give up this broken world for that glorious life and drop everything and follow Jesus, Jesus said, I've done it for you. All you have to do is trust me, hope in me. As we move on, we're going to see what that life looks like. And we want to see what it looks like in a way that clearly points to Jesus. And this is the glory of understanding our ethic that way. Is that in your obedience, and make no mistake, we're called to live a life of obedience. 
but it's the obedience of faith. When we understand the law of Christ this way, our new covenant, what binds us in our moral structure in this way, that it always testifies to Jesus, that we're called to live in such a way that the very activity of our life is a proclamation of the gospel. When we do that, we get to sit back because of God's grace and in our very activity marvel at the grace of Jesus. By the way we live, we get to behold Jesus and the world around us. Whether they know it or not, they can behold the gospel message. And then, and then someday, many times, hopefully many, many times, you know what they're going to do? They're going to ask you to give an account for the hope that lies within you. And if your life is lived in such a way that the only way you can make sense of it is the gospel, then they're going to go, huh, okay. Okay. And that's what we long for, isn't it? That they would have this hope like we have this hope. And this hope is not a vague hope. This hope is Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your son who has come. And he has hushed the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. He has accomplished everything that we could not and he has secured for his people eternal blessedness. And Lord, how we hope for that day, how we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And until that moment, Lord, would we be prudent? Would we keep our wicks trimmed and our oil full? Would we labor diligently in the vineyard of our Lord Jesus? And would we find great joy? Would we... Proclaim with Christ our blessedness, even as we're poor in spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.